Many performers boast long careers, but Felicity Kendall first appeared on stage as a baby, in India in the classical acting troupe run by her parents. The subject of the film that launched her professional career at the age of 18, Shakespeare Waller. As a stage actress, she's continued to play Shakespeare, including Much Ado About Nothing, and new works such as Peter Schaffer's Amadeus, and eight plays by Sir Tom Stoppard, including The Real Thing and Arcadia. Her TV roles include Rosemary and Time, and most famously The Good Life, in which her performance as a Surrey housewife green before her time helped to create a programme that audiences have been glad to see recycled for four decades. Because of your family's theatrical background, it seems inevitable that you would have become an actress, but was it, or did you ever consider anything else? It was inevitable because I was trained to do nothing else. I, I had very little schooling. I mean, I had a lot of schooling, but it had, took no, um, had no effect whatsoever because it was scattered over 13 or 14 convents in India. And I probably went for two or three terms a, a go, and then they moved on to the next one. So it was, I mean, it was very um, haphazard. Uh, and I was put to work when I was 12, maybe probably a little bit before, but it's certainly by 12 I was working full time. I wasn't going to school anymore. Um, and so I wasn't qualified to do anything but acting. I had been trained. I mean, I also had the imprint from my father who said that the only thing in the world um, to do is to be an actor, never own a house, have no possessions if you can possibly avoid them, play the best plays that were ever written. And that was sort of imprinted from a, you know, not just on, I heard him say this, not just to me, but it was his, his sort of mantra, that's what you do, Shakespeare, Milton and the Bible, the word, that's what's important. And you are born to be an actress, you're from a two acting um, parents, we're training you to do this. So that was already there. Then I went through a period of thinking, well, it'd be awfully nice to be a secretary and, and, and have a short tight skirt and I had read magazines and be like Doris Day or something. And then um, I eventually got to be a sort of older teenager and rebelled against this and thought, no, I don't actually want to tour India for the rest of my life playing Shakespeare. I've done this since I was a child. I've had enough. At about that time, Ismail Merchant and James Ivory made their second film, which was Shakespeare Waller, with my brother-in-law and my sister in and my father. And, and my which mother. is, in effect, the story of your family. Which is, well, it, 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 it's a sort of bastardised story because they actually had a great deal of fun and the film is slightly nostalgic and beautiful and it's about the end of the Raj in India. Um, and we were actually vagabonds, no, no way at the end of the Raj. We were just having a, a riotous time um, living the life of gypsies. So it wasn't, act, it wasn't actually the story, but there was a, there was a a similarity. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you weren't too uncomfortable here. Oh, not at all. It was lovely. I think you're just being polite. Rain. I'm sure you're used much better than this. Much nicer than I can offer you. Rain. Sometimes we go to sleep on station platforms. When you're tired, you don't mind. You don't hear the station bell going every time the train comes in. When we don't have our bedrolls, we just lie down on a stone and cows and people and power dogs walk all over us. Don't you believe me? I got to the point, I then made the film and I was now at a point when I really thought I must go and work in England. I must get a job all by myself. I can't just stay here. I'd never thought of doing anything else by this time. I was 17. I thought I would be an actress or an actor. Um... And luckily the film went to the Berlin Film Festival and then on to the Academy in, in London. And I came to England, green, um, with a slight accent like this, and a far too much jewellery and dark hair um, and absolutely no qualifications, having not been to drama school. So shock, horror, how could you possibly act? And your father was horrified, wasn't he? He was, he was more, he was beyond horrified. He was insulted, devastated, um, angry, um, heartbroken, shocked, and, and he, 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 it was the worst possible idea anybody could have, he thought, to go back to what he had left, which was degradation and the dole, you know, possibly. Um, and even worse, maybe doing terrible, terrible plays in the West End, really bad work, and being famous. 
that was also a terrible possibility for him. So there was, you know, really no win situation. Anyway, I arrived, stayed with my aunt in, in um, where the house I was born, actually. Thank goodness for her, she saved my life. Um, by giving me somewhere to live because I had no money and no opportunities and no work. Um, and I tried to get an agent and I failed dismally. I couldn't get an audition, I couldn't get an agent, I couldn't get a toe in the door of this wonderful world that I'm now part of. And I then thought, well, I have to do something else. But I didn't know what it could possibly be because... I'm very bad at spelling and I have no qualifications. And even the jobs that I went for with the, um, you know, writing to the Bristol Old Vic and the Old Vic, and they said, well, send me your CV. Where did you go to drama school? Well, I didn't actually. I was brought up in India, traveling with a theatre company, playing Shakespeare. And I have done a lot of work. I have been on stage a lot. Well, if you have no qualifications, you can't get a job. So so at, at the point of despair... And it was, after a year, pretty despairing. Um, Ismail Merchant got me an agent because he was a wonderful man who people did what they they told him, and he got me an agent. And this question of luck, it amazes me in actors' lives, uh, this, the the, the way things turn on chance. So, in your case, the, the good life, which we'll talk in more detail about later, but which you recorded in this very studio on Sunday nights. Ghosts. Yeah. There is that bit of luck being at the right place at the right time, the the first bit of luck I had was with it for the BBC, actually. Um, I couldn't get work for love or money. And my then agent was uh, had Sarah Miles, and she was going to do or was offered a two-hander with John Gilgood. Those were in the good old black and white days. The thing was that I couldn't get a job. The agent said, oh, well, I tell you what, there is this other person I've just taken on the books. Why don't you see her? So, yes, I happened to be there and I got it. And if Richard Bryars hadn't come to see The Norman Conquest, we wouldn't have done The Good Life. And the play with John Gilbert, that was The Mayfly and the Frog. Yes. He was actually very reluctant to have me to start with. I had to go and audition, have, well, not audition, but have lunch. And um, it was, I think, only the second or third television play. But he'd always done something he'd done on the stage first. It was the first time he was actually going to create a part. And he wanted to be surrounded by actors that he trusted and knew, not some young person from India who he'd no idea if I'd ever been on a stage before. Um, Anyway, I went and had lunch with him, and he was... I just fell in love with him, charm beyond belief. And we did The Mayfly and The Frog. And I was a little plump. And the director said to me, well, you can have this part, but you've got to lose half a stone and go blonde, because I was quite dark. So I lost half a stone and went blonde, and that's... (laughs) that's (laughs) The rest is history, And the rest is history. (laughs) Don't worry, you're safe with me. What about my 25 bob? I never give money away under any circumstances. Now I'm going to show you my paintings. I've already seen your etchings. Don't be impertinent. I'm going to show you my paintings because they happen to be just on the way to the front door. When I interviewed David Dimbleby recently, who came from a different kind of showbiz dynasty, he said that in his later years, he slightly regretted the inevitability of it all, that he went into his father's profession. Because it's as if he never actually made any decisions about his own life. Have you ever felt that? Well, I think... There was a point when I felt I wished I hadn't, this hadn't been imposed on me because I couldn't do it and I couldn't do anything else and I was not qualified and I was angry. And round about that time, and I was living with my aunt in Oulton, I went to see Time of Athens with Paul Schofield at Stratford. And I saw Matinee and then I went back to see the next Matinee in the week because I couldn't believe the wonder of that performance and the magic of the theatre. And I had not... I'd been in plays all my life with my father's, you know, potty touring company on desks and in little halls and all over the place and beautiful theatres sometimes, but I hadn't actually seen great acting. Um, And... I would say, with, with all honesty, that, that that was the week that I knew, no, he was right, this is the world I want 
to belong to. I just want to be in that space with this kind of magical world where you can, for some reason you can't explain, one person can control nearly a thousand people. And then amazingly, it says only about 15 years later, you were actually acting with Paul Schofield in Amadeus and Othello at the National Theatre. Yes. Spooky. It was a bit spooky. It was spooky. He was, again, an extraordinary, extraordinary actor to work with on the stage. He was so incredibly relaxed. We should talk um, more about your childhood in India. Um, it seems, people have seen Shakespeare and a lot of people have read uh, Why Cargo, the memoir. It seems extraordinary and exotic, your childhood, but does it seem so to you or was it, is it just normal to you? It didn't seem exotic at the time. I thought it was very normal um, and I was a very, I think my reactions to it were like any child. Sometimes it was fun and sometimes it was boring beyond belief to have to get up at five and get on a train. Um, I, I, I've taken with me an amazing ability to travel. I love that. I find nothing easier than getting up in the morning and going somewhere else with a lot of luggage or with no luggage. Um, but I didn't realise how magical it was. I think it was a, a gift um, that was probably almost unique for, for, for a child uh, for, for many reasons. One, because I was travelling all over India to some of the most beautiful places in the world. In the evenings, I was listening to Shakespeare sleep in the wings. Um, so I had this incredible education, if you like, of, of language. Um, I was then surrounded by a group of completely potty, um, m- mismatched in some ways, multicultural, um, politically incorrect people. Um, who I was with 24-7, apart from the odd moment when I went to work. I also travelled with a menagerie of animals because th- that's what I wanted. So they let me, a cat and, and, and um, dogs and mice and birds. and I mean, ridiculous. But it was free, absolutely free. And sometimes I, you, I would be out in a field somewhere where they would be working and I would be playing with the local goat. I remember doing things like climbing trees, eating um, fruit in the trees because I knew what was a guava or something because I knew what was there. So this extraordinary combination of being in touch with nature, being physically very comfortable because always warm, having very few restrictions except for the fact that you had to do the work. When, when I had to work, I had to work, so there were restrictions. But it was... And then suddenly going overnight on a, on a, on a bouncy bus all the way up to Simla with a lot of actors getting pissed and screaming and laughing and singing and, and then arriving and having to do The Merchant of Venice in the morning. Um, it, it was unusual, and I think I was very, very privileged to have that childhood, though I didn't appreciate it at the time. You also saw both, um, uh, or two sides of India, because you say in White Cargo, sometimes first class and sometimes third class on the train, depending on the, um, uh, how the debts were. The, the, the difference between the, the weeks would be, one week would, we would be living with the Maharaja in Udaipur in the palace, and host that we were being um, guests of. Um, and the next week would be in some dark bungalow with the cockroaches coming out and the, the snakes running around in the loo. Um, and we would have absolutely no money at all, or there would be suddenly a terrible scourge of, of influenza and all the, the cities or towns would close down the schools and we had no money. So we would be stuck in some ghastly little hotel. You, you cannot describe how ghastly it can be if unless you've been through that. But it was a gypsy-like, I guess. Kendall was a theatrical pseudonym. The family name was Bragg. Now, um, a great Cumbrian name carried on Absolutely. by Lord Melvin Bragg of Wigton. Yes. But um, what was there... You're not related yes, to those. Yes, we are. Bragg. You are? W- uh, yes, he found out. It's quite, quite far back. But it's certainly there is a connection somewhere. Um, no, my, my d- father was born in Kendall... Uh, and he was eventually a very young actor who became an actor manager. And in those days, you had to have a posh name. And Bragg was not a posh name. I mean, it was at the point, even with Maggie Smith, she was brave at that period not to change her name because Maggie and Smith, 
of course, now it's absolutely magical. But he thought that Bragg was not things. So he thought, I need, a, I need a more romantic name if I'm going to be an actor. And he changed his name to Kendall. And he'd taken a very bold decision. I mean, he, from the account in Wycargo, he seems to have been a very bold and determined man. But in, in the 1930s, in Britain, in the Depression, as, as a young actor with your mother, he, he immediately he wanted to set up a theatre company. That was always what he wanted to do. I think they, my, my parents met when they were both working in, some, in another company, and they were very, very young, and he fell in love with her. He said she came in in a white coat and a little beret, and he fell in love with her on the spot, and that was it. Um, and they were very young, and they fell in love, and then they thought, oh, well, they will start their own company. And they toured Redditch and Bath and all the um, Hull and everywhere. And um, then I think he... The war eventually came out, and he was a conscientious object. He didn't think that he wanted to kill anyone or be killed, <laughs> probably more the latter. And, uh, and that didn't go down very well, so he thought, all right, well, I work, can't be a conscientious because they'd put me in jail, so let's join ENSA. So they went to India with ENSA during the war. The military entertainment, every night something awful, as they... Every used. night something awful, and I'm sure... I'm sure... <laughs> 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 they both fell in love with India, and they played the contunements in the army barracks and and some of the public come um, beautiful theaters there and so when they came back after the war to the depression if you like and cold and gloomy and rationing and he just thought i can't we can't do this anymore we've got to go back so he went with i was just born after the war and he i was a little baby and he went back for three or four months and did a little bit of a tour and he had a lot of contacts. He, I don't know how, but he was that kind of a guy. He knew the Maharaja, he knew this and he knew that. So he got a six months tour, thought that was it, wonderful, came back, um, had another look at England and thought, sod this for a game of dominoes, I'm not living here, and went back again. And then I was, what, four or five. And um, I never came back till I, till I left home, as it were. From the account in Waikago, um, your mother, you suggest quite clearly that she put your father and acting ahead of the children? She was a very um, strong woman who didn't look... It was a very pretty small, um, quite delicate little creature. But she, had, she was really a little iron lady. Um, and she had to make... I think she had to make a decision at one point when, when they left uh, to go to India during the war. My sister was older. And she had to make a decision. She either went with my father and joined ENSA and spent, she didn't know then whether it would be three, they didn't know where they were going. They, they couldn't, you know, ring back and say, oh, by the way, I'm in Delhi. They, they literally went abroad and nobody at home knew what happened because of the secret war and all that. Um, and she had to make a decision between leaving my sister, who was 12, and leaving um, my father. And she chose to go with him. So I guess Sophie's choice in a way, but for her not. And all her life she did have... The, you, uh, you absolutely knew that she was his sidekick, she was his partner, she was going to stand by him, whatever he did. There is, there's a detail beloved of um, profile writers, and I can understand why, that you have almost literally spent your life on stage because you were, you did play a part even as a baby, they used you in a production. Oh, I think I was brought on when I was months old as the changeling boy in Midsummer Night's Dream. It's the traditional one. You bring on a, you know, you just put it in a basket. And I had to be somewhere. My mother was feeding me. So I was, that's what I played. You learned subsequently from Paul Schofield and other people you acted with. Did you learn from your father as an actor? I mean, did he, tra did he formally instruct you in things? I think I learned from my, some things from my father and I learned some things from my mother. I think the, the main thing that he had when I started was that you, the whole point is your sound. The sound you make is your instrument, and that is how you will control the audience, that is how you will convey what you feel. And my mother was very, very keen on elocution, so you, you don't slide down at the end of a line. I'm, I'm coming to tea tomorrow. I'm coming to tea tomorrow. Those sort of little... But, and, all sort of little tips and things of, again, you don't start, you know, if, that, if those, that's the wings, I mean, this is drama school stuff, but if the wings are there and you're going to come on, you don't start acting here. You start way behind 
so that by the time you're on, you're already way into it. It's too late to go on and start. Things like that that are just basic rules. And that, as we said, your, your training as an actor was being in your parents' company and in India and other places. Have you ever fantasised about three years of RADA, four years in weekly rep, that it would have been better? Or are you, I mean, are you, you're satisfied that that was your education? I'm th- not sure I've thought about that very often, but thinking about it now, I wouldn't have changed the the training I got as an apprentice. I think, in fact, I, I find it rather sad the way it's the, the extreme now is the only way into the business is through a school. Um, and the apprenticeship, which used to be there even after drama school in the big companies where the young actors could go and watch Schofield and carry a tray where watch Vanessa Redgrave and Maggie Smith and Peggy Ashcroft and just be on the stage with them, with these greats. And you learn... I mean, you copy, but there's nothing wrong with copying the greats. Um, and that is not available, that apprenticeship. So my reaction is, no, I was really lucky to have an apprenticeship of, of, of hours and years of learning how to put a wig on, learning how to make up, learning how to polish the props, learning how to take... You know, I was backstage doing, doing stage management for ever when I was little in between going to school. So after the success of Shakespeare Waller, you come back to England. This is your portrait from White Cargo of yourself um, at that time when you came back to England. I had come to India as a tiny child. I could eat hot chilies. I spoke fluent Hindi. But at 18, I had never been near a pair of stockings, owned a coat or worn gloves. My history lessons were of Nur Jahan and the great Mughal Empire. So you were, you were in effect an Indian when you came back. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd grown up speaking. I mean, I, I can speak... It's, it's not perfect, but I have no accent. I have a, a very good accent. I have, don't have an English accent when I speak Hindi. Um, and all the, the, the coats and the bits that you need, I couldn't cope with it. I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand the way you had to make an appointment to go and see somebody. Um, you didn't just turn up and they say, come and have lunch. That kind of Eastern hospitality that I had grown up with, I found sorely missing here. To be honest, I, I found that it was, it was quite a cold country to come to from India. Although the paradox of this is that quite early on, the lazy description from critics and theatre critics and journalists would be how English you were, the typically English actress. And I yet, know. So was, but was there a kind of going into the phone box and transforming moment? My, my mother and my father spoke what they called the Queen's English. So though I had an accent with my friends and in India, I, my mother's English was... Was, was very 40s, I guess. It was that kind of slightly um, plummy. And the big... Um, it, it really took off in the uh, mid-70s because of that double with Alan Akebourne's Norman Conquest um, and The Good Life. Um, because we talked about luck earlier, but that is simply the, the fact you were offered those two things and the link between them, that one led to the other. I mean, it's a classic example of how that luck works. It worked, yes, it was, it was luck. It was also, um, and Penny was in the Norman Conquest as well. Penelope Keith, yeah. Penelope Keith. But I think it was one of those things that just happened. And um, Richard Bryce came, and then he came back with the director. Um, and they said, well, if, you know, there's Penny, the next-door neighbour. That's absolutely perfect. And I remember um, Richard Dickey, as I call him, coming into the dressing room after the show and saying, it was very good and I have a script, but it's not going to be very successful. He was, of course, you know, a huge star for the BBC then. I mean, huge, huge, huge. And I certainly wasn't, neither was Penny, and, and Paul Eddington wasn't either. And it was all hanging on, on Dickie. And he said, well, I just wanted you to know, I don't think it's going to be like my other series, Long Running and Wonderful. Don't get your hopes up, because it's a quirky little idea that a very few people might like. But I like the scripts. I think it's funny. So I'm going to send you a script, and you, would you like to read it? And that was how we started, not thinking in, the, in the, any, I mean, £100 or something I got, not thinking in any way that it would go on. It was literally for the love of those seven scripts. And The Good Life, John Esmond and Bob Larby, when you read that first script, um, did, you, did you see her immediately, Barbara? No. Uh, what I saw was I want to work with Richard Bryars. 
I mean, it was as simple as that. And I thought, right, I've seen a lot of the things he'd done, and I thought to be actually cast opposite him so I can work with him. It's always been something that's been really, really, really important to me. It's not so much the part, but the, the writing and who I'm working with. And all the way through my life so far, um, things have worked out well for me when I've loved the script and I've worked well with the actors. And that's, th those are the choices I made. And that was certainly the, the case. I thought it was a very good script, very funny, very witty, very um, economic, if you like. And I wanted to work with Richard Bryars. That's been quite useful, was it? That was very useful. He hated them. Dickie, <laughs> Two or three things that he hates in his life, and then how he managed to put up with a good life, I don't know. It was his idea of hell and mud. I mean, it's very funny. But we did laugh for years all together. It was an amazing, amazing, um, amazing group of people. But that's the interesting thing, because on uh, some series, particularly in America, there's uh, jockeying between the actors and they want more money than the other one. And, but it was genuinely tranquil, was it, on The Good Life? I think one thing that made it tranquil, we were all theatre actors. And there is very much, you, you, there, there is a democracy in the theatre. There has to be, because you, you're reliant on some, somebody else. Uh, Richard Bryars, he um, had uh, trouble learning the lines, didn't he? I think. <laughs> yeah, he, he used did. to have them written around the set. He used to have them written in little slips um, behind the teapot or stuck onto a chicken or something. And what... <laughs> and... I mean, we did laugh all the time. It was, it was too, too, too funny. I, I say this as a fact rather than a criticism. In, in, in sitcom acting, it, there isn't a lot of development, is there? I mean, it, it's clear watching those shows, you, Penelope Keith, Paul Eddington, Richard Bryars, you had those characters down. Well, they did write for... I mean, Penny, actually, Penelope's character was not in the first, I think, one episode or so. She only spoke and she said, Jerry, or something like that. And the second one, she did a little bit, and they suddenly realised gold dust here. This is absolutely ha cannot be the goods, and then the next door people. It's got to be equal. The, all four people are as wonderful as each other. So they did, you know, they did start um, writing for us, and then because you're being, they're writing for what you do. You do it more easily. Um, there was, I was hard to believe, but there was a point I think when the two boys, one episode, had to get very drunk on the wine that we'd made or some kind of stuff. Um, and that was written into the script. And then Penny and I said, well, excuse me, why don't we get pissed as well? It would be... And, you know, we'd had to go to the top, top. <laughs> uh, because there's no... We can't have two darlings, young-ish darlings on television getting drunk. Can't say various words. And you can't have a woman who is supposed to be not... Uh, you know, uh, uh, down and out, getting drunk. <laughs> I said, no, but it's going to be funny. We've got to do it. So, God bless him, director John Howard Day said, no, we're going to film it like this. And if, it, you know, we can edit it out if you don't like it, da 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 da. Um, and it was one of the funniest things. Jane. <laughs> I'm a married woman. <laughs> well, so am I. <laughs> I still fancy you. Jerry, <laughs> you mustn't say things like that. It's very fluttering, but you mustn't say things like that. Of course, one reads about it in the papers. What? Wife swapping. <laughs> That's happened, you know. <laughs> to give people a sense who don't perhaps um, recall it of how big the good life was, on one occasion you had to leave Studio 6, which we're in now, and go to the biggest of the BBC studios. Um, it seems astonishing now, this, but it's all recorded on film. The Queen attended a recording of it. Yes. Um, there was... The BBC did a special thing, which they said they had... The, the Queen was going to attend. Her Majesty was going to attend with Prince Philip, was going to attend a live recording, and they chose... I'm not quite sure who chose, but they chose The Good Life as being the one they were going to come to. It is said that it's said that the palace asked for well, The Good Life. Well, I don't know. Probably if it's said, then it may, may be true. So we were told, well, you're going to actually be in a bigger studio. Not only that, you're going to have to perform for the Queen, which, of course, I quite like, because my father absolutely was in his element. He thought it was wonderful. 
And the little corridors and the whole entrance of the BBC, that week all you could see were men in white overalls painting and polishing. There were red carpets laid. The studio had sort of leather seats and bunting, if you please, and flowers everywhere. We couldn't, we didn't know where we were. We'd never seen anything like it. And, of course, an invited audience that was going to be polite, and if they weren't polite, they were terrified because they could see that in front row, Her Majesty there was was it full tiara and evening dress. I mean, the, the works. And we were there with our goats and our, in our wellies. And it was a complete opposite of the audience that went, wow, when he, um, Dickie forgot his lines, or makes silly, rude jokes about the other actor falling in the bucket. We couldn't do that because we were so afraid that we would say a rude swear word or something would happen. So we were all slightly stilted. However, once it started, it, it, was, it was a great, great show, but, but it wasn't raucous in that, that way. But it was, it was, it's an extraordinary thing to have done those recordings in a studio with a one, a, a, you know, a sort of anorak audience in front of you, random people, you know, picking their noses and laughing, and then suddenly all you can see are jewels and and bunting. It was surreal. TV fame, it's an extraordinary thing. If you're in one of those really hit TV shows such as The Good Life, people will recognise you forever, um, essentially. But that's something you had to adjust to was the the level of public recognition after that. Yes, it came very quickly, quite early. Um, I think in one sense it wasn't too obtrusive, obtrusive because they loved the character. So instead of being aggressive which um, and, and or sort of yeah, 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 it was all oh, the same it, endlessly in Marx. I thought you made your own soup. I thought you grew your own cabbages. Why are you buying a chicken. I thought that it was always the same line and you just got used to it, it was banter. Um, but that was, that was quite, quite, um, quite sudden, that, that happened to me. And you don't get that in that kind of recognition unless you're on television every week. Um, and I think probably the thing that's unusual about The Good Life is that it's still being shown. Mm. So that continues. Mind you, somebody did ask me the other day, are you still working? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever become irritated by the, the durability of the good life? I think I went through a, a phase where I was, but it was about a week. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, but it was like, oh, I think it, I know what it was. It was I'd just done something which I was incredibly proud of, which was uh, two plays in a row over two years. And it, and it was good work. And um, I did an interview, and nobody wanted to know about them. All they wanted to talk about was a good life. I thought, oh, come on, you know, get up to date. That was then, and I'm not like that. I'm not sweet and funny and milking goats anymore. So, yes, it lasted a week. And then after that, it, 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 it sort of turned, because I thought how extraordinary to have done some work that people are still watching. Um, and also, when I flick it on sometimes, which I, 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 don't, I don't think I've ever watched a, an episode right through, but you're scrolling down and saying, well, what, what, what fun can I have tonight? And there it is, the good life. And I'll, well, I just have a quick peek and I look at that thinking it's going to be embarrassing. And it's, it's, it, it's extraordinary. The scripts are so good. And the other three, I mean, I hate myself, but I always did. Um, and the other three, are so, and it's very, very well done. So how nice is that, that it's still there? So you do hate watching yourself? Oh, I do. I don't. I don't watch. I probably should have done. It's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, sure, we don't get much leisure time these days, but who needs it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take Margot and Jerry. You know, right now they're probably lolling about in their Swedish armchairs, sipping martinis, vegetating in front of their colour telly. <laughs> I mean, who'd swap for that? I'm bloody <laughs> Of the roles that followed um, The Good Life, we, we were talking about Amadeus and Othello at the National Theatre with Paul Schofield. Um, Clouds with Michael, Frey, Michael Frayne's play, yes. which you were in with Tom Courtney yes. in the West End, which is significant because directed by Michael Rudman, who, that's where you met him, and then you've subsequently, you've effectively been married twice. I'm not, not married, but, but I'm you're, back, yes. You, my boyfriend, I call, him my, your... I call him my boyfriend. Now. So he's been, your hu- <laughs> he's been your husband followed by a gap, and, it, and now your boyfriend. <laughs> 
I can't remember how the offer came, but probably just through Michael Codron. And, um, he's a theatre producer. He's a theatre yeah. producer. And I loved Michael Frayn's play. And this was a play that had been done in Hampstead. And they said, Tom Courtney. And I thought, wow, what a combination. And then I met Michael Rudman uh, and Tom Courtney one evening. And I didn't think much of Michael um, because I thought he was rather American. I sort of slightly fell for him during that. And, um, but he wouldn't ask me out, which was rather cross-making. Oh. Because... I was in the play that he directed, and he didn't think that was right anyway. So, um, but when it finished, he, we went out, and that was that was that was the next a terrible chapter in my life. It's terrible. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> most of the, um, I mean, in, in the end, um, uh, most people meet their partner at work or at university. Those are the two places. But is is it more likely in show business that? I think it is. I think, I mean, my first husband I met doing a two-hander. And I think one of the things is you, you, you meet somebody and you have to become very intimate with them very, very quickly. So a lot of barriers go. And if you do get on, you get on sort of double quick. It's like the, 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 the glue sets faster. And it is, um, I mean, there are uh, some people have done it, but it's quite unusual to divorce someone and then end up with them again later. Yes, I don't quite know what happened there. I think we divorced very badly because it didn't take. So it didn't work. We actually went out to dinner the night we divorced. Um, it was something that maybe, you know, luck and whatever, maybe we need not have done that. But because those bonds were still there later on, they just, I just ended up back where I started in this case. The playwright in whose plays you've most often appeared, apart from Shakespeare, Tom Stoppard, almost 20 years of work, um, on the Razzle, which was an adaptation, The Real Thing, Hapgood, the radio play in the native state, which then became the stage play, Indian Inc., revival of Jumpers. Um, so during that long period, what, was he actually writing parts for you? No, well, no, not at the beginning, no. Um, and then uh, Michael Codron, again, my champion producer when I was much younger, um, did Tom's next play, which was The Real Thing which people think, or how I've read, was something to do with me. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. He wrote it before I hardly knew him. I mean, I might He's have made seen it absolutely clear, because it was yes. a play about a playwright it's who... A playwright and an actress. actress. And, I mean, it would be nice to think, affair, oh, yeah. that, that's, uh, you know, art mirroring reality. But it, it, it wasn't maybe reality mirroring art later, but certainly not. That was not the case. Um, I think he then... I would say the, 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 the play that he wrote for me was Indian Ink um, because that really was related to India. He grew up in India. Um, that's to do with sisters, um, and that was definitely... It was actually, a, a, as you say, a radio play. In the native state? In the native state. And it was, we did it with Peggy Ashcroft. It was amazing. Um, and a uh, funny story about that because we did it, and there's seen, you know, then she takes off all her clothes because it's hot. And the two instances in, in a, accepting a play that I hadn't thought through, and one was I'd done the radio play, so when it became uh, uh, to go into the audience in the theatre, I thought, well, I've done it, of course I want to do it. And, and only after having the thing, I thought, she takes her clothes off, <laughs> which, of course, on radio is no problem. It doesn't matter what you do on radio. You don't have to take them off, unless people think you do. You really don't. And that time, um, in the native state, when you were doing that in radio, that was the time when the gossip columns were going mad. It is said there were tabloid reporters outside Broadcasting House when you were recording that play, because they were on the yes, trail. Yes, that yes. Was, That is that, true. That, yeah. that, that, that was. I was actually, I think, in Hidden Laughter, which was a Simon, Simon Gray, Gray play. Yeah. play. And that was a time when, yes, you had to... Um, it was all, all that flashing stuff going on a lot. Um, it was, I mean, any, any period that I think anybody that's been through that, you, you know, I, I, with everyone else, reads the tabloids and reads the thing, and, you know, I'm under the, the, having my hair cut, and there I am saying, oh, look at that. Can you believe what she's wearing and all that? I mean, it's na it is natural, but it is, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable when you're going through it. But as I say, you know, you don't, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, you can't... Um, I haven't been I haven't been burnt in the way that a lot of people in this business have. 
But also it's interesting because at the time we're talking, there's the whole um, inquiry into privacy and the press going on. I mean, you and Tom Stoppard tried to keep it as private as possible. I mean, you, neither of you wanted to be in the papers with it. But I mean, it just in the end, it's impossible, isn't it? I think, I think that it, it, any kind of friendship like that, I mean, the thing is that the combination of what people write and what is the truth, the somewhere in the middle is actually the truth. And, and a lot of it is a waste of space trying to say, but excuse me, the real truth is this and this and this, because people may not believe it. And anyway, if something else is written, it's written. I mean, we were incredibly close friends for a very, very, very long time. And I think it's because I divorced, that's when it all became, which had actually got nothing to do with the friendship with Tom. And um, it is, you know, it is what it is. You can't go back and say, well, yes, it was exactly like that. It isn't something that I talk about a lot because I, basically because it, 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 it it's a period where there was a lot of unhappiness with a lot of people for all, all sorts of natural reasons we were going through. I was I just had a, a little boy and I was being very unhappy about all sorts of things I had no reason to be unhappy about. So there was conflict at home, which ended in a divorce. And 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 I think he, the, the, the fact that he was there as a friend, then everyone jumped to conclusions very quickly. Um, and we continued being very close um, for quite a few years. And he wrote, we worked very, very, very well together indeed. But both, neither of us are the kind of people who say, well, actually, this is actually how I feel and this is what happened. We tend to both be quite secretive about certain areas of Would you work lives. together again? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you haven't for quite some time, but that's just because the, the roles weren't there. I think, I think it's because it isn't. I think it's because he, um, you know, wrote for different people at different times. Um, I would be... I would be quite surprised if, if we didn't work together again. That, that would be a surprise to me. 1989 Best Actress Award from the Evening Standard. Now, your father would have approved of this. Um, Much Ado About Nothing and Ivanov, yeah. Chekhov and Shakespeare double. That's what he, the kind of thing he wanted you to do, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. I mean, that to him was, that's exactly what he wanted. Um, I remember I did something which got very good reviews, and it was it was some series a very long time ago. And he said, "This is not how you're going, is it?" And I well, then I auditioned for a film, which was a Bond film, which I didn't get. And he said, "Thank Christ for that." Which Bond film? I can't remember. It was one. Oh, it was a, quite a long time ago. It was, was one of the Dolly Birds, which I was completely not right for. Um, and he said, "That's fantastic." And I said, "Are you crazy?" But yes, that that was that that was his idea. Do Shakespeare, um, and do it well. The problem the Good Life gave you was following it on TV, and there were various attempts. When you look at it now, you worked through all the possible relationships a yes. woman could have because yeah, there were the two Carla Lane shows. There was Solo, in which a woman her boyfriend cheats on her; she's on her own. There was the mistress in which she's having an adulterous relationship with the woman. And then, which wasn't Carla Lane, it was Michael Aiken's um, Honey for Tea, in which you were playing a widow. And yes. were you conscious you were going through the variations? I think I was. Um, I think, in a way, they were all too similar, even though they were different stories. I think, I, I think looking back on it, what was wrong was that um, I was very successful at being slightly kooky, but I think what happened was that then when, when a script was written for me, it, they still tried to use some of the same um, ingredients in it. And because uh, I wasn't playing that part, it didn't quite work. And I think I would have been much cleverer to go for something a little bit, it, it's something more extremely different. And I think that was what was what was wrong. They were still quite cute little women. And as the years went on, people wanted something a little bit more challenging. Oh, you're back, are you? <laughs> How do I feel? I feel fine, just fine. I attended to all my enemies, gave up my job, got three others, left them and fell off my bike. <laughs> I've completely confused my mother. She thinks I'm a lesbian. How do I feel? How do I feel? 
I feel frightened. It's also the bad side of TV fame, isn't it? That um, according, I am told uh, by the BBC, that some of the audience reaction to the mistress was Barbara Good is having an affair. Oh, we can't. They didn't like that at all. They really didn't like that. In fact, I got quite a lot of rude letters saying, how can you play this kind of woman? As if, you know, I was letting Barbara Good down. Um, but as I say, even so, it was still quite funny and sweet. Whereas if that character had been edgy and aggressive, it would have removed itself from Barbara so much they wouldn't have objected, if that makes sense. I thought we'd take a weekend. Look, don't say anything. Just don't try and make up to me. Don't say a thing. When? Soon. <laughs> Where? Anywhere. How? Somehow. <laughs> it's not my fault. Fault, you know we're in this mess. You could have ignored me that first day. You gave me the come on. <laughs> oh, yes, I go to bed with everybody who comes into the shop to buy flowers for his wife. The question of um, feminism, because when we look back, you were rear of the year at um, one point at the peak of your... More than once. More I than think. once. Were you? Well, how many years? You didn't... No, I think no, two. Two. Um, did you ever have feminist qualms about that kind of stuff? The, the qualms I had about, uh, with two things, one after another, the qualms I had about that was that they said you've won this rear of the year, and I thought, oh, well, that's nice, and you get 70 pairs of jeans, and I, I thought, I wear nothing but jeans, bring them on, send them around. OK, we're sending them around tomorrow, and we're sending the photographer with them. So when you, will you try all the jeans on, and three pairs, please have some photographs taken looking at your butt in these jeans. And I said, no, I'll get the award, and I think, but I'm not going to have my photograph taken looking at my butt but send the jeans by all means, and I never got the jeans. So that was my take on that. In other words, no, I won't be... You can't photograph my butt because you give me an award. It's an astonishingly sexist idea, isn't it? Yes, so that was my, my reaction to that. Um, and I think also, thinking about it, as even though I was playing fluffy Barbara, I've always done exactly as I wanted on my own terms, and I think that is what we are trying to fight for. Having said that, in our business, it is a little more equal than in a lot of businesses. I mean, we, you do go in there as an actor on, on a par. Uh, maybe not the same money, but that comes later. But more equal than in your early days, because in the early days of your career, um, there was blatant sexism and indeed sexual harassment, wasn't there, in showbiz? I think there was, and I think that's why I considered myself a feminist and I never considered... Um, myself to be a, a, a little woman who, who wanted to please anyone unless it was on my own terms. Um, when I went into the business early, early on in the auditioning days, the, the, it was absolutely the norm to hear um, or experience that one was chased round the round the desk, and you would get the job if you went out to lunch, dinner, and maybe a few more things. Um, uh, certainly in films, certainly with agents, there was a couple of famous people who only took young girls on if they were very, very sweet to them. Um, things like that. And I I have to say that kind of thing, I immediately just wouldn't have nothing to do with. Um, not out of a, an idea that, um, in, a, in a moral sense, it's just because I... I no. <laughs> Looking at the roles you've played in theatre, um, new plays such as uh, Humble Boy by Charlotte Jones, uh, Vortex by Noel Coward, um, Revival, have you generally just waited to see what you were offered or do you go out and seek roles? I, I usually wait and see. And I think the things that, the, the plays that excite me like Humble Boy um, it's, it's writing, it's new writing, which is odd because I was told to do the old stuff. I have been asked now and again if I can think of something to do, and I, I, I really invariably can't. I, I can think of a hundred wonderful parts to play, a hundred wonderful plays to be in, but I've never got the courage ever to be one of those people to say, look, let's put this on, I'll be good in this, I'll make you money back. There are certain uh, types of roles that have recurred. Um, you've played a lot of drunks and a, a significant number of male roles. So um, you played the principal boy, as it were, in On the Razzle, and then Simon Gray, or one of the Simon Grays, uh, in The Last Cigarette, um, his final play, he wrote with Hugh Whitemore. Um, so we can talk about why that is. So, so why, why so many drunks? You, you liked playing those. I don't know. I, oh, I, I just, well, I, I, it isn't that so many drunks quite so many drunks. I mean, I did, in Amy's view, I got her drunker than I think she should have been. Um, because I like doing it. <laughs> um, and I'm reasonably good at it. I just, I, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to be 
pissed but not completely drunk. Um, and it's just something I, I enjoy doing. It also it, 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 it means that you can drink all the way through the evening, which is awfully nice on a hot summer's evening in the theatre, to know you can go and pour another gin and tonic that's water and go like that. I don't know, it's very physically liberating as well to, to be drunk, and maybe I just know what it feels like. And the playing, <laughs> playing the male roles, um, you've got, uh, uh, I mean, a, an unusually deep voice for a woman, so presumably that does. Yeah, and you've got that register, I can haven't go, you? It, can, I it can goes go, deeper it can than go. most women, yeah. Yes. Um, well, I grew up playing men, boys, didn't I? So I suppose it's also that. I'm very comfortable being a man. Um, that's how I started with Puck and all those Balthazars and, oh my goodness, all the, yes, exactly. When the reviews of Shakespeare Waller came out, we, we might have thought, if we'd bet, that you would have a, a more significant cinematic career than you have. Um, have you regretted that? Yes, in that, that I'm greedy. I mean, if I have something that I really do um, think I could have curbed by now, it's my... I always want more of everything that's going. Um, and I suppose now I wish I had more of a... have had more of a career in films... But then I go back to what I said earlier on. It's that one thing leads to another. And I very definitely chose to, to always choose theatre or a play uh, ag- uh, uh, against something maybe more lucrative or further afield. I always chose not to go to Broadway, which for all sorts of reasons, usually to do with a child, um, one could say was a mistake now, but it was my choice and I had the time uh, with it. The, the, the children um, so I can't say now honestly I don't but on the other hand I wouldn't have had which I have had um, the line of new plays one after another after another with these wonderful wonderful modern writers which, um, which I, I think in itself cancels out any regret Strictly Come Dancing some people are, remain snobbish about um, these TV talent shows. Did you have any qualms about accepting? Um, well, I'm a bit of a groupie. I love that show anyway. And for me, I don't see that as a reality show in the same way because the things that I think are slightly insulting is making a, a, a tit of yourself, you know, in public or making yourself, putting yourself up to be made to look an idiot or a fool. And that, I think, is degrading and, and you know, don't take the money, don't do it. So you're talking about things such as um, cele- I mean, celebrity wife swap. And, uh, yes, things like uh, that. I'm a you, celebrity, get me out of whereas here. Whereas potentially you, you're going to fail looking like a complete prat. You know, the worst of your nature is going to be shown to a lot of people that don't know you, and your family may be very embarrassed. But that's, that's, the, that's the possibility. The thing about Strictly that's different is you're learning a craft. Um, you're learning something with professional people, not just people filming you, but professional teachers. So that was something that I immediately wanted to do when they offered I, 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 A lot of people said, are you insane? I didn't regret a minute of it. I loved it. And you get so fit. <laughs> <laughs> White Cargo, which you wrote while your father was dying, it, it only takes your life up to the late 70s. Will you ever write the other half of the memoir? Do you know, and probably not, because I don't think it's that interesting. It's boring to me because to write it down, because I've done it already, so why do I want to write it down and bore anybody else? But they so, want the relationships, don't they? The That's relationship. why they ask you. Yes, that. exactly. So I always said no, because it's not interesting to me to write about the relationships, because I, I'm interested in the one I'm in now. Um, and, but then what happened was my father died, and, and various things to do with the history of India and um, the, the, the sort of extraordinary life that I lived as a young woman learning to, a young child learning to act on the stage in Shakespeare in, in India. And I thought, what he did was interesting, and he was dying, and he was the... Blah, blah. So I wrote what, White Cargo for him, but it was actually an autobiography, but it was, it was about his bringing me into the world of the theatre. It was not about my relationships. 
Very important question. Have you had or would you have cosmetic help? I think it's too late. I think if I was in films, I think there is absolutely no question. I don't think you have a choice. It's the same way as you do the teeth. You can't... I mean, if you, you either do it or you stop working. But I think in... If you're an actress in theatre, I think that's a mis it's probably a mistake. So, no. <laughs> you never have and you never would? No. I think it... I mean, no. I think because my career relies on me playing parts that... I'm that right age for, so why would I try and have a bit of me that looked younger? Unless you could start at the bottom and lift, ev which you can, of course, but then you don't look like anybody, and lift everything up, it never would match. Few, um, few people like um, getting older, but you're in a profession where there is this very cruel gaze, particularly at women looking for signs of ageing, counting wrinkles and so on. How, do you inevitably become neurotic about it as an actress? I think you, I think you do. I, don't, I, I think you do as a woman. Um, I think the female thing is, um, oh gosh, here we go, this, this ten years, now I'm here. Um, but I, I think when I was 50... I was less happy to be 50. Um, now I'm 52. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here because I'm sort of, in a sense, it's, I'm a very good version of it. Um, and that's wood. Where's the wood? Yeah. Wood. I'm very fit uh, for my age. Um, and you do get very, you get quite brave about things. Things don't worry you in the same way. Um, and I also, I think if you were... In, uh, another thing about regretting being in films, I think if you're in films, it must be horrendous because you really do have a sell-by date and otherwise you're playing grannies um, and only grannies because of the number of lines you've got on your face. Um, so that must be very hard to take because you still want to work and you can only work in a restricted way. But I think in the theatre that doesn't happen. So um, I think... You know, you, you know, I flick on the good life, and I, my goodness, that's a very smooth little face. But then I also think you haven't had the experience that I've had, and you haven't done all the wonderful things I've done, and you're not as brave as I am now. So, Felicity Candle, thank you very much. Thank you. And Mark's talking to another great actress next weekend as he chats to Zoe Wanamaker about comedy, Shakespeare and her remarkable theatrical heritage. That's here at 10.45 next Sunday. <laughs>